Welcome to FMSP Online Revision. This session is for OCRFP1, Complex Numbers. So we're going to start by taking a look at the specification for complex numbers. And after that, we'll then work through some exam questions to try and enable you to get as many marks as possible when you come to sit the examination. So let's start then with these specifications. So the first three points here. Part A, understand the idea of a complex number. Recall the meaning of the terms real part, imaginary part, modulus, argument, conjugate, and use the fact that two complex numbers are equal if and only if the imaginary and the real parts are equal. And then in part B, carry out operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication and division of two complex numbers expressed in Cartesian form. So that's in the form x plus iy. And then part C, use the result that for a polynomial equation with real coefficients, any non-real roots occur in conjugate pairs. So if, for example, here we have a polynomial, let's take a cubic, x cubed minus 5x squared plus 3x plus 1, for example, then if, for example, x plus iy is a root, then what this is saying is that the conjugate, which is x minus iy, will also be a root. And just one other thing we could mention at this stage, that if, for example, we have z represents this complex number x plus iy, then the conjugate of z we write as z with a little asterisk. So moving on, three more points in specification. So part D says uh, we should be able to represent complex numbers geometrically by means of an Argand diagram and understand the geometrical effects of conjugating a complex number and of adding and subtracting two complex numbers. So if we take an Argand diagram, then just remember what we've got is we have a vertical axis and a real axis. So the ver real axis represents the set of real numbers, real part, and the vertical axis represents the imaginary part. So if we have, for example, uh, a complex number 2 plus i, then its conjugate will be a reflection in the real axis so 2 minus i, the conjugate, is a reflection of the complex number 2 plus i. So that's what they mean here by the geometrical effects. When it comes to adding and subtracting two complex numbers, it's probably a good idea if you just think about vectors and work you will have done when you're adding vectors. Then in part e, we should be able to find the two square roots of a complex number and in part f illustrate simple equations and inequalities involving complex numbers by means of loci in an Argand diagram. So there are sort of three main ones that we need to look at. This one has first of all is associated with a circle. So we have a less than k here so we're actually looking at the inside the circle and not the circumference. If it were equal to k then we would be looking at the circumference of the circle. So this one represents a line and so it's worth remembering that the line is the perpendicular bisector of the line joining the points A and B. And then this third one is a half line and that half line will start at the point A and it will make an angle of alpha with the positive real axis. So having looked at the specifications, now let's just start looking at some exam questions. 
So the first one that we're going to look at, uh, question two, so a slightly more straightforward question at the beginning of your paper. So we have two complex numbers, z and w. And giving your answer in the form x plus i, y, we've got to show clearly how we obtain 3z minus 4w in part 1 and in part 2, z asterisk, so the conjugate of z divided by w. So let's just start by doing the first part, 3z minus 4w. So it is literally just a matter of substituting in the values of z, so 4 plus 3i, and the values of w, 6 minus i, multiplying out the brackets, 12 plus 9i minus 24 plus 4i, which is equal to minus 12 plus 13i. So two marks for the question. You get one mark for the real part and one mark for the imaginary part. And then we'll look at part two. So in part two, we're asked to divide, and it's the conjugate of z divided by w. So if z is equal to 4 plus 3i, then the conjugate of z will be equal to 4 minus 3i. So the conjugate of z divided by w will then be 4 minus 3i, divided by w, which is 6 minus i. Now at this point, we have got to make the denominator real. So it's a little bit like work that you've done on thirds, where you've made, got to rationalize the denominator. Here, we've got to make this denominator real. And the trick is that we will multiply by the conjugate of w. So we'll multiply top and bottom line by the conjugate of 6 minus i, which is 6 plus i. So I'm going to just put brackets around everything here, and we're going to now just multiply out carefully. So in the numerator, we're going to have 24 plus 4i minus 18i minus 3i squared, and in the denominator, now the advantage of multiplying by the conjugate is of course that the imaginary parts minus 6i and plus 6i will cancel out, and all we're left with is 36 minus i squared. And now if we simplify the numerator, we get 27 so remember i squared is negative 1, so that becomes plus 3, minus 14i. The denominator will be 37. And what we then, just the last thing we need to do is make sure we give the answer in the form that was mentioned up here, x plus iy. So we need to express this single fraction as two fractions the real part, 27 over 37, minus the imaginary part, 14 over 37, i. So there were four marks for that question. Uh, you got one mark for writing down the conjugate of z correctly. You got a mark, a method mark, for multiplying by the conjugate of omega, that is 6 plus i, and then you got two accuracy marks here, one for the real part and one for the imaginary part. So let's move on to another question. So this is now more associated, if you like, with the geometry of complex numbers. So we're given a complex number A. It's denoted by 1 plus i root 3. We're asked to find its modulus written like that, and its argument. And having found those, the second part then asks us to sketch on a single diagram the loci, 
given by mod z minus a equals mod a and the argument of z minus a is equal to pi over 2. So just be aware it does say a single diagram. So both of those on one diagram. So let's start with part 1. So a is equal to 1 plus i root 3. So the modulus of a is given by Pythagoras theorem. So it's just going to be the real part squared, 1 squared, plus the imaginary part squared. So that's 1 plus 3, so it's the square root of 4, which is equal to 2. And then the argument of A, so the argument of A will be given, so we're looking for an angle here, the angle that our complex number here, 1 root plus root 3i, we're looking for the angle that this line makes with the positive real axis. So the angle is going to be given by tan to the minus 1 of root 3 over 1. And hopefully you know that the angle whose tan is root 3 is pi over 3. But you could equally well write that as 60 degrees if you did it in degrees rather than radians. Or if you gave it as a decimal in radians, that would also be acceptable. So there we have part one, and there is just one mark for each of those things. For one mark for finding the modulus of two, and one mark for finding the argument. So we'll look at part two. So in part two, we've got mod z minus a is equal to mod a. Now we now know, of course, that mod a is equal to 2. So basically what we're looking for is we're looking for a circle centre 1 root 3 and radius 2. So I've marked 1 root 3 on. I'm just going to draw a freehand circle now and bear in mind you don't need a compass or anything either so you also can just draw a freehand circle probably the very important just to realize that of course because our modulus is 2 that our circle is going to go through the origin so just joining those points up So we have a circle. Now it's not beautiful, but it has got all the important points. And so that's what you need to be able to do as well. And then the second part of that question asks us to draw the loci represented by arg of z minus a is equal to a half pi. So hopefully we remember that a half pi is 90 degrees. So basically what we're going to be looking for is we're going to be looking for a half line. It's going to start at this point again, 1 root 3, and it's going to be make an angle of pi over 2 with the horizontal, with the real axis. So it is going to be a vertical line. Now you've only got to show this on your diagram, so I'm just writing in a few little bits to help us, but all we've got to show is this, that we've got a vertical line starting from here, so that it is parallel to the real axis, so this angle is pi over 2. So six marks in total for part 2. So you got uh, one mark for any circle, one mark for showing that it's had a centre of 1 root 3, and then the final mark was showing that it did go through the origin and it crossed uh, 
the vertical axis at another point too, so the correct circle. And similar sort of thing when it comes to the marks for the argument. So you will have got one mark for any line through this starting at the point 1 root 3 with a positive gradient. You would get a second mark if it was a vertical line and you would get the third mark if it was completely correct, all aspects correct. So a third question. Now this question is asking you to find two possible values for a where a squared is equal to 5 minus 12i. So basically what we've got to do in this question is to find square roots. So let us just start by say, letting a equal to x plus i y. Where a, well, sorry, x and y are real. Now that's important. So we're going to let a equal x plus i y. So basically therefore what we're saying is that x plus i y all squared, a squared in other words, is equal to 5 minus 12i. So on that basis, if we square this, both sides, we'll get x squared minus 2xyi plus i squared y, which is minus y squared, and that has got to be equal to 5 minus 12i. Now the trick now is to equate real and imaginary parts. So that's what we're going to do now, is we're going to equate real and imaginary parts. So if I take, and I'm going to, just for convenience, I'm going to take the imaginary parts here. So on the left, we have got minus 2xy and on the right we have minus 12y. That of course should be a plus. So on the left we have plus 2xy and on the right we have minus 12. So that means that 2xy is equal to minus 12. So xy is equal to minus 6. And the real parts now, here we have x squared minus y squared. Those are both real and those must therefore be equal to 5. So generally speaking the technique will be to take this imaginary part and rearrange it to find a value for either x or y. I happen to have done it for y and then substitute in here. So just bear in mind that if y is equal to minus 6 over x then y squared will be 36 over x squared, but we must remember we've got a minus sign there. And what we need to do now is multiply through by x squared, so we end up with a quadratic in x squared. Which Hopefully at this stage they should factorise, and this one certainly will, so it will be x squared minus 9 upon x squared plus 4 equals 0. So x squared could be equal to 9, that's alright. Uh, this factor of course means that x squared would be equal to minus 4, and that is not possible because remember x is real. So we ignore that possibility and we concentrate on this one which tells us that x is equal to plus or minus 3. And bear in mind that if x is plus or minus 3 then y, if x is plus 3, y would be minus 2 and if x is minus 3, y would be 
plus 2. So I'll write that with the minus and the plus the other way around. In other words, we have two complex numbers, 3 minus 2i or minus 3 plus 2i. So our two complex numbers, the square roots. So in terms of marks, five marks in total for the question, you got a method and an accuracy mark up here for uh, equating your real and imaginary parts. So a method mark and then an accuracy mark for doing it correctly. You got a, a mark here, a method mark for getting your quadratic in x squared. And then a method mark here for working out x equals plus or minus 3, y equals minus plus 2. And then an accuracy mark for your two roots. So we'll now look at the last question in this session, which is about roots of polynomial equations. So let's just read through the question first of all. So one root of the cubic equation x cubed plus px squared plus 6x plus q equals naught, where p and q are real, is the complex number 5 minus i. And what we're asked to do in part 1 is to find the real root of a cubic equation, and then in part 2 to find the values of p and q. So let's look at part one. Now there are different methods in which we could do this question, but I'm going to use the fact that when we come to do this, this bit here, the real root, I'm going to use the fact that we have uh, results from roots of polynomial equations. However, first of all, we have to write down and appreciate that if 5 minus i is a root, then 5 plus i is also going to be a root. So we have two roots which are non-real and the third root then is going to be real. Let's call it gamma. And as I say, the method I'm going to use is using the results from roots of polynomials. So if you look at this equation, then we know that the coefficient of x cubed is 1 p is the coefficient of x squared, and, but, and we don't know it, but we do know that the coefficient of x is 6. So that is equivalent to our c if we had a general cubic ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d. And of course that means I could use the results that sigma alpha beta is equal to c over a. And our c is equal to 6, and our a is equal to 1. So if we take the product of the roots two at a time, so that's 5 plus i times 5 minus i time plus 5 plus i times gamma plus 5 minus i times gamma, then that must be equal to 6. So again this is a root times its conjugate so the imaginary bit will disappear. We'll have 25 minus i squared which is 26. We'll have a 5 gamma plus an i gamma there and we'll have another 5 gamma minus i gamma over there. So that is equal to 6. These will cancel out and we're left with 26 plus 10 gamma is equal to 6. So 10 gamma is equal to minus 20 and gamma equals minus 2. So the real root is minus 2. So that is our answer. 
there were three marks for that part. You got one mark for writing down the fact that the conjugate is also a root. You got a method mark for uh, using sigma alpha beta equals c over a correctly and then an accuracy mark for working out the value of gamma. So as I say there are different ways in which you can do that and mark schemes will take that into account. So the second part of the question asks us to find P and Q. So notice P is equivalent to B in the sum of the roots is equal to minus B over A and Q is equal to D in the product of the roots is minus D over A. So those are the results that I am going to use to do this question. So if we're going to find P first of all then we're going to use the fact that the sum of the roots is equal to minus B over A but of course in our case that's going to be minus P over 1 so it's just going to be minus P. So if we just add the roots together 5 plus I plus 5 minus I plus minus 2 that will be give us a value for minus P and of course again the imaginary bits here disappear and we end up with 8 equals minus P so P is equal to minus 8 so that's our first answer and then in the second bit we're going to use the fact that we have got the product of the roots is equal to minus D over A but of course in our case D is equal to Q and A is equal to 1 so that's going to be minus Q and the product of the roots 5 plus I times 5 minus I times minus 2 is equal to minus Q. We've already worked out 5 plus I times 5 minus I to be 26 so we have 26 times minus 2 equals minus Q so Q is equal to 52. and we have our two answers. Now there were four marks for that question and in each case you're getting a method mark for using the sum of the roots and an accuracy mark for finding the value of P correctly and in this bit it will be a method mark for the product of the roots and an accuracy mark for Q equals 52. So we're going to finish this session here and all it's left with to do is to remind you to work through as many exam questions as possible. That's always the best way to revise.